Right. Um, let's now talk about the exam, because you know that's what a lot of you are really looking for. Now, if you follow through the videos and stuff, you'll notice that I quite often refer to the book from a chapter and section perspective and you know the actual generalized um, layout of the book and <clears throat> you'll realize through this video why I've been doing that and I've not been kind of specifically referencing certain points and certain ref um, certain regulations I've been kind of having a general understanding on the layout structure and context of the book I've got 60 questions line up here now these are questions that I've typed up granted they are questions that I've seen but you know uh, and I'm probably gonna have a little bit of a, an understanding of where to find the answers you know but uh, I, I can say is I typed them up a while ago and I don't know in what order they are and you know what I will do is instead of going oh yeah well this is this and this is this and this is this as I'll actually explain how I'm looking at the question, how I'm reading the question, and how I'm determining the answer. Sometimes I'll determine the answer without even picking up the book. Obviously the first thing is make sure you've got the book. Because some answers I'll come up with before I've even done that, but for completeness I will kind of just, you know, try to eyeball some some answer to, to a point. Um, so let, let's just um, let's just push on through. So the first thing, let's let's um, let's remind ourselves of the exam itself. So you'll have two hours to answer sixty questions. That's an average of two minutes per question. Don't dawdle, don't idle. If you have this religious thing where you you just have to see the answer in the book, you'll find yourself struggling when you get to the back end because you'll just realise that you've run out of time. You spent too much time looking for that answer that you knew. The instinct that you knew was correct, but you've been confirming it for yourself. And you've run out of time. <clears throat> Often people run out of time. <clears throat> um, I get it. I know the regulations, um, and I find the exam quite easy. I can do it in a matter of minutes. But, you know, um, that's because I don't always look for the answers in the book. There's a flagging system that you'll see on the exam sim um, software. I can't show you the software. Um, Sitting girls don't like that. Uh, but you can always, you know, the, the instructor will pass you through an opportunity to, to do a tutorial. But there is a flagging system. So my my advice is if you see a question, you go, oh, well, that's that. And oh, there's the answer. That matches that. Yeah, that's that. Answer it and flag it. And then that way, when you come to the end of the exam and you go, okay, well, I've done. You then can see some ones that you flagged that you didn't eyeball. Or maybe you just went with your gut instinct. You now have that little bit of time left to go back and then, if you want, confirm by finding the answer in the book. Same with questions that you weren't too sure about. But do, rem do remember, and I see quite a few people, even though I advise them, they still ignore it. If you leave a question unanswered and you carry on, it will stay marked unanswered. And if you finish the exam with unanswered questions, an unanswered question is a wrong answer. So go with something. Go with something, even if it's one of the two that you think it could be. Go with one of them. Um, if it's something you're completely oblivious to, put something down and it's flagged. Come back to it. All right, but don't leave questions unanswered. Okay. Um, right, so I'm going to need a clock. Uh, two hours. So let's put a clock on this. Um, there we go. We'll keep him up there and let's get him ticking. I probably probably won't get anywhere near two hours anyway. Let's get that ticking. How do I, how do I make this tick? There we go. All right, that's countdown. That's my two hours now. Um, I doubt this video will be two hours long. We'll see. But I'll, I will go through them as I go. Now, what I will say is I'm going to... I've started my time and I'm not even starting it. The questions I'm going to go through are questions that I wrote down on a question paper, uh, Sparky Ninja 2382 Paper 1. In the paper, they were written in a random order. The reason they were written in a random order is when I did my exam, on like the second or third day um, that they were out, they were random. 
and a few people have said, yeah, they're random. They're not in order anymore. It appears from the past three courses I've delivered, having invigilated the exam since, they are now in order. So I will go through the questions from that paper, but I've restructured the order. So if you go, that question's not question number one. I know. All right. But the question is on that paper. You just need to find it. So if you want to confirm with that paper, otherwise, you know, we'll see them here. Uh, but here, obviously, this is from the City and Guild um, handbook. This shows you the quantity of questions. I really should have started that clock a little bit later. Anyway, quantity of questions from each part. Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, Part 4, Part 5, Part 6, Part 7, and appendices. Numbers of questions. You can see the quantity of questions come from parts 4 and 5, nearly half. That makes sense. They were big sections. They were big parts. Okay, so <clears throat> let's start. Question one from part one. What is a fundamental principle when considering the cross-sectional area of conductors? You can see I took these up in a hurry. Cross-sectional area of a conductor. Now, why do I think this is a part one question? Because it's talking about sizing of cables. You know, the clue here is fundamental principles. Scope, object, and fundamental principles. The fundamental principles, being scope, object, and fundamental principles. Fundamental principles is the third. So that's likely to be in the third chapter of the first part. It's not chapter three, though. It's probably chapter 13. So if I then open the regs book up, and I think, okay, it's a fundamental principle. Um, I can, I mean, straight away on page three, contents, I can see chapter 13, fundamental principles. This is a good starting point. Let's go there then. So I'm going to go to chapter 13, Fundamental Principles. Now this says the fundamental principle when considering the cross-sectional area of a conductor. Okay. Well, the cross-sectional area of a conductor was not with regards to protection for safety. So let's turn the page. Basic protection, fault protection... No, those are protective measures. That that was all back back in part forty, um, chapter forty one. That's not that. Thermal effects is chapter forty two. Overcurrent, chapter forty three. Fault current, and voltage disturbances, chapter forty four. So none of this. Is it to do with the design then? Well, yeah, sizing a cable is a design thing, so it must be here in one three two somewhere. So okay. Uh, AC, DC, voltage values. Let's go further. Oh, there we go. 132.6, cross sectional area of conductors. What is a fundamental principle when considering the cross sectional area of conductors? I'm here in the fundamental principle section, chapter 13, or fundamental principles chapter, and there's a section there, 132, on cross sectional area of conductors, 132.6. <clears throat> So what's here? We've got nature of the location, electromagnetic interference, and admissible voltage drop in frequency. Well, if I look at that, I go through that list, I can see that I have admissible voltage drop. So I'm going to go with C. Now, to be honest, when you looked at the question and you thought about sizing of conductors, how much we covered it in uh, the chapter 52, you probably would have gone with C anyway. But there it is. All right, it's there. So it's going to be C, and that's 132.6, and it's 2 in the list of 132.6. So question 1 is C. Okay, I'll move on. Question 2. Which part of BS7671 relates to the technical requirements for inspection and testing? I mean, I don't need to look. It's part 6. I know that. You should know that. If I want to see it... I can go to the contents. It's there, part six on page three. But why is this here? Why is this question here in part one? Maybe it's mentioned somewhere else. Well, it is. It's mentioned back on as he flicks for it to find it. There we go, the objects and effects. OK, 
Okay, it's measured with the objects and effects 120.3. And that gives you blah 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 the fundamental principles of chapter 13 as follows. And it says there part 3, part 4, part 5, part 6 inspection and testing. That's why this question exists at this point in your exam. So, question 2 is D. Question 3. <clears throat> BS 7671 relates to electrical installations in. Okay, let's remember part one, scope, object, and fundamental principles. This question is scope related. So I'm going to go back to chapter 11. Now, it relates to electrical installations in. So it's not saying it does not include installations in. It says it relates to installations in. So this is an inclusive of scope question, not an exclusive of scope. So I'm going to stay in 110.1, general. Which of those is listed in 110 general? Horticultural premises. Now again, I've looked for it. I found it. It's 110.1.1. And in the list, it's 12 in the list there. But to be honest, if you've looked at part seven and you've understood the special installations and locations and you've figured out that 705 is agricultural and horticultural locations you probably would have known that without looking for it fair i thought so but yeah so three is a horticultural premises you'll notice these other three answers you'll see them listed in the exclusive of scope section 110.2 and while we're at 110.2, which is exclusive of scope, here's a question. Question 4. Which installation is excluded from BS 7671? So it depends on how you read the question. I mean, it's saying which is excluded. So three of these should be included. And if we think about what we've done in BS 7671 with part 7, etc. We know mobile or transportable units is in part 7. We've just verified agricultural or horticultural premises is in part 7. And we know highway power supplies and street furniture. Is highlighted in the scope of lighting but it's also mentioned in the inclusive of scope offshore installations though mobile and fixed offshore installations 110.2 and in the list it's five simple exclusive of scope question inclusive exclusive you can see we haven't gone into a lot of detail there we've just understood the part one area We're now going to move from part one to part two. So question five is from the definition section. What is defined as the interface between the fixed installation and the heating unit? So you have a heating unit and a fixed installation, the interface between them, that connection between a underfloor heating cable and the mains. What's the specific name for that? If you're not sure, then just look at each of the questions, answers in part two definitions look up a control gear look up monitoring cable look up cold tail and when you get to one of them such as cold tail you'll read the definition of cold tail is the interface between the fixed installation and a heating unit so it's c 5c cold tail so if you had no clue just look at the answers in part two find the question simple next question from part two what is defined as a floating deck structure which is designed or adapted for use as a place of permanent residence same thing look at the answers till you find the question so let's look up jetty that's not there houseboat houseboat Floating decked structure which is designed or adapted for use as a place of permanent residence, often kept in one place or inland water. Floating decked structure designed or adapted for use as a place of permanent residence. So yeah, B, houseboat. Six is B. Okay, seven. Moving to part three now. 
So we've gone from part one to part seven. We're now in assessment of general characteristics. Is there anything here in the question that can tell me that? Yeah, maximum demand. It's one of the requirements of the characteristics that we have to assess for. So if we go to part three, if you're not sure about this, we know we're in part three. The very first thing we see is purpose, supplies, and structure. And it's got there maximum demand and diversity. Now, obviously, you may be tempted to go to the index and look for maximum demand. Up to you, but you shouldn't have to if you have an understanding that maximum demand is part of the assessment of general characteristics. To remind yourselves of what we've looked at in the videos before. So it says here, for economic and reliable design of the installation within thermal li li limits and admissible voltage drop. B. Okay, so B. Seven is B. Eight. Which is a consideration when inspecting the general characteristics of the supply. So we know it's general characteristics, so we know we're in part three, assessment of general characteristics. Supply? Well, there's a supplies section in part three. Yeah, chapter 31, purpose, supplies, and structure. So in chapter 31, I'll find 313, supplies. Notice, right, you can't really see my book, but I'm staying open from one question, and I might turn in the page one or two to the next one. In your exam, don't shut your book. Leave your book open, and the next question may just be two or three pages backwards or forwards. So what is the consideration when inspecting the general characteristics of the supply? We have the nominal voltage. We have the nature of the current and frequency. That's there. We have the respective short circuit currents at the origin. That's there as well. We have the earthful loop impedance. External. There. And we have simply the requirements of installation include mass and demand and the type of rating of the overcurrent protected device. Okay. So read the question again because that's confusing. What is the consideration when inspecting the general characteristics of supply? Let's look at what characteristics of supply says. The following characteristics of the supply or supplies from whatever source and the normal range of those characteristics were appropriate, here we go, shall be determined by calculation, measurement, inquiry, or inspection. The question is asking you, which of these is more suitable for just inspection? So think about the way that's worded then. Am I going to identify the nature of the current and frequency by inspecting it visually? No. That's probably going to be an inquiry. Am I going to identify the external earthfall loop impedance? ZE. By inspecting it. And I'll be honest, technically you could. Because if you knew the earthing arrangement, you could verify the maximum. But no, in this case, they're saying no, because that would be a, a calculated or measured value. Same with the PCC at the origin. The type of earthing arrangement, however, we don't inquire for, we don't calculate, and we don't measure it. We identify it with inspection. But is type of earthing arrangement there? No, I'm, I'm, I'm covering this in a lot of detail because this is actually a very common scenario. You have a question and it'll be written in this way and the answer is type of earthing arrangement, even though it's not worded in the book as a supply characteristic. 
I know this because I have seen someone answer this and get it wrong. So type of earthy arrangement is an inspection only thing. So A is A. Nine. It is recommended that a two-story dwelling should have a minimum of two lighting circuits in order to... Still part three. Two-story dwellings. This tells me that I'm thinking of division of installation. And that's 314. Next page. So 314. It is recommended a two-story dwelling should have a minimum of two lighting circuits in order to avoid danger, minimize inconvenience in the event of a fault. Avoid danger in the event of a fault. Facilitate safe inspection, testing and maintenance. No. Take account hazards that may arise in the failure of a single circuit. No. Reduce the possibility of unwanted tripping. No. Mitigate the effects of electromagnetic disturbance. No. And prevent the direct energizing of a circuit. No. So it's going to be avoid danger in the event of a fault. Question 9 is C, and that's from 314.1, and it's 1 in the list. Still in part 3, we're question 10. What characteristic of equipment would need to be assessed for compatibility? Characteristic is the clue in the question because it's a general characteristic and the place to go in characteristics is compatibility. Look at the next page, chapter 33, compatibility. Transient over voltages, no. Under voltage, no. Unbalanced loads, rapidly fluctuating loads, starting currents, harmonic currents, earth leakage current, come on, where are you? Excessive protective, no, decent, no, high frequency, no, oh, it's right at the bottom. Power factor, C. Question 10 is C. 331.1, 12 in the list. Still from part 3. What earthing system is shown in this image? Remember, the earthing systems are poorly illustrated, but they are there in part 3. So in this illustration, we're going to identify the intake position of the supply and the consumer. Consumer, intake, and this is the part we're looking at here. This arrangement. So this is Terra Neutral TN. And then here, you'll see it's run separately. So it's T N S. If it was T N C S, it would be T N C with a pen conductor, neutral and earth. Then in here, it would separate to earth. But T N C S. This doesn't. This is just T N S. If it was a T T, there'd be an electrode over here. So, you understand that earthing systems is important with the regulations exam. So it's B. A is B. Sorry, A. Um, question 11 is B. <clears throat> question 12. Still part 3. What is required to prevent the indirect energizing of a circuit intended to be isolated? That sounds familiar. We just discussed that one in 314. Division of installation. I'm sure we did. So every installation should be divided into circuits as necessary to the very last one on the list, six in the list. So 314.1, six. Prevent the indirect energizing of a circuit intended to be isolated. That's the question. It's achieved by dividing it into circuits. No, no, yes, no. It's 12 is C. You get that from 314. All right. Question 11. Uh, sorry, 13. Ah, we've gone now to part four. 
Where the nominal voltage of an installation is 230 volts, the required minimum impulse withstand voltage for Category 2 equipment for over voltage protection is. Okay. Click clue words here. Protection. That tells us it's part four. Protection for safety. Now is it chapter 41? Protection against electric shock. Chapter 42, protection against thermal effects. Chapter 43, protection against overcurrent. Or, or chapter 44, protection against a voltage disturbance. An over voltage is a voltage disturbance. So we're going to be looking here at chapter 44. Chapter 44. And if I turn, I'm looking for impulse withstand voltages. Now, I mean, I know where I'm looking, but I'm just seeing if you can understand how to find it nice and easily. As we go through it, we'll talk about protection against voltage disturbances. We have atmospheric origin, 443, which we consider as an impulse duration. And we then have 443.6.2 impulse voltages of equipment and over voltage categories. Yeah, category. And then we have that table 443.2. All right, so let's look at the. Now we've identified this place, let's look at the question one more time. Where well, the nominal voltage of an installation is 230 volts. Required impulse minimum for Category 2 equipment. Okay, so find 230 volts in that table. Nominal voltage of 230 volts. And we go to Category 2. Over voltage Category 2 equipment with normal rated impulse voltage. It's 2.5. So it's B. So the answer to 13 is B. We get that from Table 443.2. Finding the 230 volts in the left column, which is slash 400, and going all the way along to the category 2 column, sorry, the 230 volt row, go all the way to the category 2 column, and it's 2.5. So 2.5 kilovolts. Permissible withstand voltage. Now, I said earlier on I don't close the book. I'm still not going to close the book, but I do need to remember that part 4 is quite large, and the next question may take me elsewhere within part four okay in the parts they can go backwards and forwards the question three uh, 13 is b okay 14 what parameter is identified by the symbol ib there are a couple of places you can find this in the book actually you can find it in appendix four and you can find it obviously in the symbols in part two in principle, it doesn't really tell you what IB is, but it gives you an understanding of what IB represents. But the best place to find it is where it's used, first of all. And when did we use IB? We used IB when we talked about coordination. We talked about the need to understand that the protected device must be greater than the design current, which is IB. And the protected device was IN, and the cable was IZ, IB, IN, IZ. We had that little bit of coordination. We introduced that when we talked about protection against overcurrent. And that protection against overcurrent is chapter 43. So if I go back to chapter 43. Protection against overcurrent. I can then go through that. I've got protection, I've got introduction, protection according to the nature of the circuit and distribution system. I then have nature of protected devices, but then I have this bit, and this is where it's really coming from. Protection against overload current, 433. Uh, Coordination between conductor and overload protected device. Every circuit shall be designed so a small overload of long duration is unlikely to occur. And it says the operating characteristics of a device protecting a conductor against overload shall satisfy the following. The rated current or current setting of the protected device, IN, is not less than the design current, IB, of the circuit. And the rated current of the device, IN, does not exceed the lowest current of the capacities of the cable, IZ. So IB 
is a design character. And the way that we're thinking here, yeah, well, the way that we're using it is to understand that IB is the current used in normal service. I've dropped my pen. Okay, because that's how it's used here. It's not the current rating of a protected device. That's IN. It's not the tabulated current from the method connected. That's IT. It's not the cable. That's IZ. It's the cable. It's the normal service use. It's the natural power demand. So IB is A. Uh, so 14 is A. Question 15. The requirements for protection against shock are satisfied if... Now this isn't written down in this way in the regulations. Obviously the understanding of the regulations is, you know, results in this knowledge. Um, there's some formula back in Appendix 4 which kind of gives you a little bit of ZS equals R, you know, UO over IF which is just how to calculate it. It doesn't tell you this. If you actually translate though the content of Chapter 41, this is what it tells you. So the ZS actual must be less than or equal to the ZS maximum tabulated or the ZS actual must be greater than the maximum tabulated or it must be less than R1, R2 or, not, or ZE is 0.8 times ZS. So the reason I know it's in chapter 41 is because the question says protection against shock. That's chapter 41, protection against electric shock. So if I think about chapter 41, and I look at the way it uses protection against electric shock, which was the first protective measure, 411. It gives me formula, you know, ZS must be less than or equal to U times C min over 2. It doesn't tell me that formula at all in here. It doesn't show it drawn, it doesn't show it written. It's all about understanding when you read chapter 41, how it's using it. So, if you actually go through it and you look at, let's see if we can find it exactly. All right, so basic protection, earthing, bonding, augmented description. So, except as provided by 41.3.2.5, so I'm, re I'm reading this from 41.3.2. A protected device will automatically interrupt if the supply to the line conductor and circuit or equipment in the event of a fault of electrical impedance between the line and conductor is both conducted with the protected conductor and the circuit or equipment within the disconnection time required. So, the protected device is suitable for isolation of at least the line conductor. It's telling you here that it must be quicker. So, the ZS actual to be quicker must be less than the maximum value that we can tabulate. Um, but bear in mind, if you just look at the um, the information given in file 411, and maybe even maybe even the title of table 412 will be enough to tell you the maximum earth for loop impedance, the maximum tabulated, yeah, and our actual must be less than that. So it's B. So it's all about. This kind of question is all about understanding it and seeing it written differently. All right? I know some people will scour through the regulations looking for this, um, this this kind of wording. It's just not there. It's about your understanding of the, the chapter itself. And that the clue that gets you there is there. Protection against shock. All right? That's what gets you the answer. So 15 is B. 16. A final circuit has a measured R1 plus R2 of 0.71 ohms, a measured ZD of 0.08. The calculated value of the ZS for the circuit is, again, this is similar understanding of chapter 41. So we need to understand the overall value of earthfall loop impedance, ZS, is equal to the external value of earthfall loop, ZE, plus the internal line and protective conductor resistance, known as R1 and R2. So we add R1 and R2 to ZE, which gives us a ZS. So this is going to be 0.71 plus 0.08, which is 0.79. Answer is C. ZS is going to be 0.79. 
17. Which section of the ESQCR prohibits the use of a pen conductor within the consumer's installations form part of a TN system where fault protection is provided by ADS? Now, I know people often would go to, you know, uh, Appendix 2 for this because it's got legislations in it. Uh, the clue here is, again, ADS, pen conductor. So I'm still in Chapter 41. A pen conductor isn't part of a TT system, but the clue's there. It's part of a TN system. So if I go to 411 and I look for the TN section, so 411, protective measure, or about to of supply, and then go looking for the TN, 411.4, TN system. It then tells you about pen and P conductors to earth, a neutral point. If I then turn the page, then tells me 411.4.3. In a fixed installation, a single conductor may serve both the protective conductor and as a neutral conductor. Blah, blah, blah. Says in the note, Regulation 8.4 of the ESQCR prohibits the use of pen conductors in consumer installations. So I found that not by looking for regulations scattered around or for ESQCR, I found that by understanding I was in the ADS section of protection with TN systems. So I was in chapter 41, TN systems, pen conductors, and it's just there. 18. Which is an example of a location where arc fault detection devices are recommended? First thing I'm going to say to myself is where is this in the regulations? What is an arc fault detection device? Well, that's new in this standard in the 18th edition, but we know that that's a device that's been introduced to prevent risk of fire that can occur in parallel and series arcing events. We're still in part four. So, protection against fire, well, that's protection against thermal effect. That's 42, chapter 42. So, I'm going to go to chapter 42. Okay, I have 421, protection against fire caused by electrical equipment. And as I go through there, I notice 421.1.7, arc fault detection devices. It then has a note, examples where such devices can be used, and it's got there, premises with sleeping accommodation. That's it. So 18 is A. That's 421.1.7 in the note. 19. <clears throat> what circumstance would allow 13 amp socket outlets to have additional protection removed? Okay, before I actually jump in looking for it. Additional protection was part of the protective measure, automatic disconnection of supply. It was an additional measure. So I now want to go back to chapter 41, to 411, and there's an additional protection section in there. And it actually says there, socket outlets. So additional requirements, 411.3.3. .3. And what circumstance would allow 13 ounce socket outlets to have additional protection removed? It says there, in AC systems, additional protection will be needed for socket outlets not exceeding 32 amp and mobile equipment not exceeding 32 amp for use outdoors. An exception to one above is submitted for where other than an installation in a dwelling, a documented risk assessment determines it not necessary. So when a location in a dwelling, no. When socket that's a supply using surface mounted, no. 
When the socket outlets are labelled for a specific item, not anymore. When located in an office with a documented risk assessment. Okay, so this is a non-dwelling environment. So it's D. So question 19 is D, and I get that from 411.3.3, .3 .3, uh, just after number 2 in the list. Number 20. What is the maximum permitted residual operating current for an RCD? Slated to protect a TT installation having an earth electric resistance of 100 ohms. TT systems. Well, I'm still in chapter 41. Does this relate to that? Yes, it's all about RCDs and protecting against electric shock. So I'll go to the TT section. Which is 411.5. And in there, I see a table. It tells me the maximum earth loop impedance for a 100 ohm. Well, it doesn't actually give me the ohms. It gives me the milliamps, and it gives me the earth loop impedance. So I could easily have said, oh, 100, there's 100, it's 500. And that tells me 500 milliamp. But that's not actually what it's telling me there. Yeah. But if I actually look at the column the other way around, it does tell me that. Uh, rated residual operating current of 500 milliamp is for 100 ohms. So you go down the ZS column, that's the old resistance there. You go down the ZS column, 100 ohms, and it's 500 milliamp. I'll be honest though, me, I just use Ohm's law. I would have 50 over that. It's just, that's how that's worked out. So I'd have calculated it instead of looking for it. But yeah, you find that from table 41.5. Answer is C. Question 21. For a self impelled circuit where the nominal voltage exceeds 25 volts, basic protection shall be provided by. Well, circuits of self impelled are part of their own protective measure. So I'm not in 411 anymore. I'm not in 412. Double reinforced insulation. I'm not in 413, electrical separation. I'm in 414, extra low voltage provided by self or pelve. Basic protection. Well, it's got the requirements there to band one, band two. There's no mention of the voltage there, though. If I scan through, I can see already. 414.4.5 keeps mentioning this voltage. If the nominal voltage exceeds 25 volts, basic protection will be provided by insulation in accordance with 416.1 or barriers or enclosures in accordance with regulation 416.2. So the answer is B. Okay, sorry, my kids were awake, and I've just lost a few. And I've just lost a few minutes, so let's resume. Okay, um, we've done that one. Question twenty-two: To meet the requirements for protection against fault current, all over current protected devices without backup protection the supply side must be capable of. Okay, so protection against fault current is a protection against an overcurrent. An overcurrent is either an overload current or a fault current. So we're going to go to protecting against overcurrent, which is chapter 43. Right. Now, specifically about fault current. So within chapter 43, we'll find a fault current bit. Four, three, four. All right, what does it say again? To make the requirements of protection against fault current, all over current protected devices without backup protection on supply side. Okay. Positioning. All right, so it's going to be a characteristic of the device, isn't it? Because it needs to achieve this. 
Okay, so 434.5.1. Except where the following paragraph applies, so unless the paragraph following mentions, then the rated short circuit breaking capacity of each device will not be less than the maximum perspective fault current at the point of which the device is installed, withstanding the maximum perspective fault current. And that is where a lower braking capacity is permitted if another protected device or devices having the necessary capacity is installed on the supply side. And this is saying where there's no protection on the supply side. So this is saying when that paragraph is not applicable, then as it says just above it, it must be no less than the maximum perspective fault current. It must withstand the maximum perspective fault current. So 22 is C, and that's from 434.5.1. But it takes a bit of reading to twist it round to understand the question properly on that one. 23. Which class of equipment provides protection by double or reinforced insulation? Uh, so this again, this is without actually you know thinking too much about this. We've covered this a lot when we talk about protection against electric shock. We had four general protective measures: protection against uh, there was automatic disconnection of supply, double or reinforced insulation. There was electrical separation and self and pelv. In the double and reinforced insulation, 412, it talked about specific equipment needing double or reinforced insulation and it set a class there. But to be honest, if you're a PAT tester, you know this one. And that is 412.2.1.1. Equipment shall be of, and it says class two. We also have that symbol, the square and a square. So 23 is C, class two. 24, which is the most commonly used protective measure in an electrical installation? Uh, well, that's obviously automatic disconnection of supply, ADS. I don't know if it actually says that though. Does it say that? I think it does actually. When it when it talks about them, the, the the general protective measures, I think it says underneath it. Yeah. Okay. So four one zero dot three dot three. The in you know the beginning of chapter forty one. It it gives you the general protective measures that I just mentioned, but then if you read the note, in the electrical installations, the most commonly used protective measure is ADS. So twenty four is D. 25. What is included within the scope of chapter 42? Well, you we can just look at it if we want, but we've already covered that. It's protection against thermal effects, because we've already had a question in there on art fault disconnecting devices, haven't we? Let's go there. So we turn to chapter 42, and that is simply reading the title of the chapter. Um, chapter 42, protection against thermal effects. So 25 is B. 26. Where arcs, sparks or particles at higher temperatures may be emitted by fixed equipment in normal off service, the equipment must be still in part 4. Arcs, sparks or particles. This is not an electric shock. This is not an overcurrent or a voltage disturbance. This is a, a thermal effect. It's an equipment creating a thermal effect characteristic. So if we stay in 42, which we've just arrived at, Let's look at equipment or anything that says arcs, sparks, and particles. Well, 421, protection against fire caused by equipment. Four two one dot one dot three. Where arcs, sparks, or particles at high temperature may be emitted by fixed equipment in normal service, the crew will meet one of the following. It will be totally enclosed in arc resistant material. No. Screened by arc resistant material. There we go. C. Uh, May to allow safe extinction. No. Although adequately verified. No, that's not. I'm not reading that right. Uh, or in compliance with the standard. 
So the answer is C. 26 is C, and that's 421.1.3, uh, and it's 2 in the list. Uh, 27. For a distribution circuit forming part of a TN system, the permitted disconnection time must not exceed. Okay, so this takes us back to protection against electric shock, the protective measure of ADS, chapter 41, 411, and we had that table in TN systems, and the table told us if the circuit was a final circuit, up to 32 amp, or a socket outlet circuit up to 63 amp, then we'd use the table. If it was a final circuit over those, or a distribution circuit of any type, we wouldn't use the table, we'd use the regulations below the table. So let's go there. Chapter 41. Testing this electric shock. 411, to measure automatic disconnection of supply. And then we have 411.3.2.2, which gives us the bit I just said. But then is for a distribution circuit, for a TN system, we know it's 411.3.2.3, because that's a TN system. And for a distribution circuit, it says five seconds. So 27 is D. Okay, 28. What must a flat profile PVC PVC cable, which is installed within a partition having metal parts, be protected by? Okay, you'll notice we've now moved to part five. So I'm immediately thinking this is a a selection, erection, a protection against impact thing. Because the metal parts rings 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 true to an area about impact protection. So that's going to be in chapter fifty two. Let's have a look. Fifty one's common rules. Fifty two social register of a wiring system. Um I can see on the first list there on chapter fifty two that impact is five two two dot six. I wanna go look at that. Cable installed under a floor or above a ceiling. Cable installed in a wall. I think the next one. Yeah. Irrespective of its buried depth, a cable concealed in a wall or partition where the internal construction of which includes metallic parts other than metallic fixings, such as nails, screws and the like, shall be provided with additional protection by means of an RCD having the characteristics of regulation 415.1.1 which is a 30 milliamp RCD, or comply with 522.6.204. And 522.6.204 tells me it's an earth metallic covering, an earth conduit, an earth trunking, which is why it tells me in the question, it's a twin and earth. It says it's a twin and earth to remind me, and this is the reason why I knew it was here, that this cable doesn't have a an earthed or an armoured first layer. And if you were to penetrate it, then there'd be a risk. And then I saw the metal parts, I just knew that this is where this was. But yeah, it's 30 million par CD. That's 522.6.203. 29. A durable copy of a schedule relating to a distribution board must be. Okay, so this is a, like a notice, like a sign. So that's going to be in... Common Rules, Chapter 51, and I think 
section 514 was the identification and notices. Yeah, 514 identification and notices. Okay. A durable copy of a schedule relating to distribution board must be. Let's just scan through. Protective conductor, pen conductor, other conductor. Bear conductor. Letters and numbering, alphanumeric, colour marking. Diagrams and documentation. A legible diagram, chart or table or equivalent form of information shall be provided indicating the type and composition of each circuit. Method of compliance with 4.0.3.2 information. Ah, here we go. For simple installations, the foregoing information may be given in a schedule. A durable copy of which will be kept within or adjacent to each distribution board. So the bottom of 514.9.1, 29 is D. Thirty. What is the minimum CSA of a single core stranded copper for an auxiliary circuit? The clue here: auxiliary circuits. So we know that there's a section on auxiliary circuits. I believe that was in other. But I mean, if you kind of lose track of it, you can always go to the beginning of the parts to see through it. Uh, I think it's in 5.5. Five. Brum, brum. Five, Let's go to chapter 55 and check. So other equipment, chapter 55, I can see 5.5.7 five, is auxiliary circuits. So I'm going to go through to 5.5.7. Five, five, I'm probably going to be looking for a table with that, if I remember right. Okay, 557.4.1, minimum cross-sectional area for auxiliary circuit, single core stranded copper. Single core stranded, 0.5. So 30 is 0 0.5. 30 is D, and that's from 557.4.1. And we are exactly around the hour mark, halfway mark, and we're exactly on question 30. So we're moving at a good pace. 31. Extraneous conductive parts are provided with protective equipotential bonding to ensure that the parts are completely isolated from Earth, dangerous potential differences are reduced, the water mains can be used as auxiliary Earth electrode, or there is no connection with circuit protective conductors. Extraneous conductive parts are provided with protective equipotential bonding to ensure that. Now, that's going to be earthing and bonding, chapter 54. And it's regarding extraneous conductive parts. Mm -hmm. So, it's not an earthing requirement, it's not a protective conductor. It's going to be bonding, main protective bonding and supplementary bonding. You'll notice the wording of the question isn't actually in there. Because it says, Strange conductive parts are provided with protective echo potential bonding to ensure that. And it doesn't really word it that way. 
so maybe it does it elsewhere. Combine protective earthing, earthing, earthing. Types of protective conductor. This is, this is all earthing at the beginning of the section anyway. Earthing conductors, insulation earth arrangements, earth electrodes, and earthing arrangements. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can actually take this, although this is a part five question which comes from chapter 54, we can actually get this from the supplementary bonding part where we talk about this in protection for safety, and it will give us the Ohm's law 50 volts. Which we can get from a uh, four one five dot two. Um, yes, it's a part five question, but it's more about understanding the purpose of the bonding. And bear in mind that we apply the Ohm's law of fifty volts. We don't want to go above fifty volts. We have to understand with bonding, and I hope I've made it clear throughout this this, this video course, is the potential differences between exposed and strange conducted must not exceed conducted parts must not exceed fifty volts. So the answer is to dangerous potential differences are reduced. That's the intent. That's the intention of the uh, connection of extreme conductive parts to bonding. So thirty one is B. Thirty two. A bare buzz bar used with a protective conductor should be identified. Identified. There's a clue. So go back to five one four. Identified. When necessary, by equal green and yellow stripes, the minimum width of each stripe is. Bare buzz bar. Oh, there you go. Protective conductor, 514.4.2. A bare buzz bar used as a protective conductor should be identified when necessary by equal green and yellow, each not less than 15 mil, and not more than 100. So C, 32 is C, and that's from uh, 514.4.2. Thirty-three, a supplementary bonding conductor is a conductor connecting the earth terminal to the earth electrode. The live conductor linking two or more circuits in an installation. The protective conductor linking strings and exposed conductive parts, or the protective conductor linked to the neutral of the supply. This kind of question is an awkward one because you won't see the wording here again in chapter fifty-four. But that's what that's why it's here because we have part five in chapter fifty-four. This question has been written this kind of way, so it could be used in two places in the example. Once here in part five, once in definitions with the pictures of the earthing and bonding arrangements. So it's deliberately worded, so it could be used in two positions. If we were to think about the very back end of chapter 54, it does talk about supplementary bonding. It tells us, when we get there, crikey. Five four four dot two. Supplementary bonding is a conductor connecting the earth terminal to the earth electrode. No, that's a main earthing conductor. Live conductor linking two or more circuits in an installation. That's crap. Protective conductor linking extraneous and exposed conductive parts. And a protective conductor linked to the neutral, which is the pen link. No. If we look at Protective conductor linking extraneous and exposed conductive parts. And then we look at 544.2.2. A supplementary bonding conductor connecting an exposed conductive part to an extraneous conductive part. So that's telling you that it can be a supplementary bonding conductor. So that's, that's why that's there. So that's the answer, 544.2.2. Supplementary bonding is C. 33 is C. 34. A 230 volt single phase heating circuit has a design current of 19 amps. The length of the thermoplastic insulated cable is 25 meters and has a voltage drop of 11 millivolts per amp per meter. The voltage drop under full load condition is. Um, this is just understanding how to apply the volt drop formula. You don't need to look in the book because it's here. Millivolts per amp per meter. 11 per amp per meter 
11 times 19 times 25. Eleven times nineteen times twenty five equals and then because it's in millivolts we want it in volts, we do that over a thousand and you'll see you get five point two. So thirty four is A. Thirty five at what point in the electrical installation should a Type 1 SPD be installed if needed? Again, this could be, you know, could this could this be in part four with over voltage where it's mentioned in protection against voltage disturbances? Could this be in appendix 16 with the SPD layout? We're in part five. So let's look here at the devices for protection against over voltage. So it's five three four. Okay. I've actually just opened the page on it, I think. Five three four dot four selection direction of an SPD dot one. SPD types and location. That makes sense. Where SPDs are required, SPDs installed at the origin shall be type 1 or type 2. And it says in the note, type 1 SPDs are often referred to as echo-potential bonding SPDs and are fitted at the origin. No, not the furthest point. Adjacent to the light protection system? No. At the origin? Yes. Before the distribution is meeting point? No. So C, 35 is C. 36, a source for safety services should be installed as safety services. 56, chapter 56. A source for safety service. So we go to sources, 5, 6, O safety services electrical sources for safety services is 560.6 .6, and source for safety services installed as 560.6.2 safety sources is for uh, safety sources for safety services shall be installed as fixed equipment so 36 is B 560.6.2 Okay, moving on. 37. What is a suitable method for connecting a DC auxiliary circuit to a main AC circuit? Hmm. Where have we seen connecting DC to AC? What's the keyword here? Auxiliary. Let's go back to auxiliary circuits. They were in chapter 55. Five five seven. We had in there a suitable method of connecting DC to AC. It did tell us five five seven dot three dot two power supplies, and then it said in dot one via a rectifier. And if you look at the illustration of the rectifier, it's got an overload protective device or a fuse then the rectifier to DC so those three illustrations one is fixed directly one is for DC and one is for a lowered voltage with the transformer so we're looking at the DC one five uh, figure 55.2 and it illustrates a rectifier and a fuse a uh, fuse and rectifier D 37 is D Okay, next. Uh, 38. Where cables are placed directly in the ground, they should be buried at a depth. 
Okay, so burying a cable in the ground. This again makes me think about impact. Burying a cable. So, I'll go back then. <laughs> right, so... Uh, right, there it is. Um, 522.8.10 which has been reworded except where installed in conduit or duct which provides equivalent protection against mechanical damage a cable buried in the ground shall incorporate an earthed armour or metal sheath or both suitable for use as a protective conductor the location of buried cables should be marked by cable covers or suitable marker tape then it says buried conduits and ducts shall be suitably identified and then buried cables Conduits and ducts shall be at sufficient depth to avoid being damaged by any reasonably foreseeable disturbance of the ground. So sufficient to avoid damage. That's the answer, 522.8.10. Right. Oh, um, 39... A still earthy conductor buried in soil is not protected against corrosion or mechanical damage. The minimum size of the earthing conductor is. So this is regarding sizing of a buried earthing conductor. An earthing conductor is in chapter 54. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. Chapter 54. First table you see. Table 54.1. Minimum cross-sectional area of a buried earth. It can be what does it say in the question? It's steel. I mean, do make sure you see that. Steel. And it's not protected against corrosion or mechanical damage. So, a cable that is not protected against corrosion, not protected against mechanical damage, steel is 50 mil. So, question 39 is 50 mil D. 40. The maximum operating temperature of a thermoplastic insulated cable. So this goes back to sizing of cables and the limiting temperatures. Chapter 52, selection direction of wiring systems. Current carrying capacities of cables, 523. There's table 52.1. The maximum operating temperature of a thermoplastic insulated cable. 70 degrees at the conductor. So, A. 40 is A. 41. Supply circuit of an insulation monitoring device. So, a monitoring device. This is a device. So, we go to the part of part, the area of part 5 to do with devices. So, that's going to be 53. So isolation and switching, 537, 538. Monitoring devices, an insulation monitoring device, no no less. So that's 538.1. Installation of insulation monitoring devices, 538.1.2. And then anyway, the supply circuit. Okay, there's a sentence here. The supply circuit of an IMD shall be connected either to the installation on the same circuit with the connecting point of the line terminal and as close as possible to the origin of the system or to an auxiliary source. So no, no, no. Yeah. 41 is B. 538.1.2. 41 is B. 42. Notice we're now going to part six. Okay, we've got 42 minutes left, and we're now heading to part six. Things are going to start getting a lot easier at this point. All right, so part six, testing. Let's remember the tests are given in sequence. They're introduced in the book in the sequence they should be carried out. So, part six, part, get, get out of the way, part five. You're horrible. Right, the first test given. Continuity of conductors. The next test given, four. So it's either C or D. The insulation resistance, one, four, one. So let's confirm, three and two. The next test given, protection by self and pelve, three. So four, one, three. And then polarity, 
4132. Question 42 is C. Which testing will be carried out with the supply energized during the initial verification? Well, we're in initial verification territory. We're in testing. Right. It says there, 643.1, in the fourth one down, the tests of regulation 643.2 to 643.6, where relevant, shall be carried out in that order before the installation is energized. So up to dot six, polarity. So which testing will be carried out with supply energized during the energy initial verification? Anything that's after four, uh, 643.6. So insulation is not that is gone. Continuity is gone. Continuity is gone. So it's C, earth for loop impedance, because that's six four three dot seven dot three. So yeah, it's an energized test. So forty three is C. Forty four. Who should re the report be issued to following a periodic inspection? So we go to periodic inspection and testing. Chapter 65, who should the report be issued to following it? Reporting, 653. Uh, upon completion, the uh, testing and electrical installation report will be produced. It will include the following. Okay, 653.6, the per report shall be issued to the person ordering the inspection and testing. So D. 653.6 will be issued to the person ordering the inspection. 44 is D. 45. What test voltage is applied to valve circuits? Okay, let's go back to the tests. In 64. This one catches people out, I think, because this one, they go to the table of insulation resistance and they'll see in that table of insulation resistance, uh, 643.3.2, table 64, they'll see self impelled there and they'll go, oh, 250 volts. The question though, is for Felv. If you actually look, two paragraphs underneath that it says fell circuits shall be tested at the same test voltage as that applied to the primary side this is why the question has the primary side voltage of the source so there's the secondary voltage there's the primary voltage so we test to the same voltage as the primary voltage which is 230 which is 500 volts so the answer is 500 volts d so 45 is D. 46. We're now in part 7. When you're in part 7, you can kind of just chill for a little bit. You've got plenty of time, hopefully. And the, the clue here is to always just identify the area. So here we're looking for exhibition shows and stands. So we'll go to that. Exhibition shows and stands. 7-Eleven. Height above a floor level where luminaires do not need to be fixed or guarded. All right, so that's an that's an issue with regards to luminaires. So is there an area for luminaires? Seven eleven dot five five nine luminaires and lighting. Five five nine dot five protection against thermal effects. Luminaires mounted below 2.5 meters or arms reach from floor level. Shall be fixed or guarded, etc. So and this is saying they do not need to be fixed or guarded. So yeah, 2.5 meters, the maximum height above. So the answer is B. 46 is B, and that is from 711.559.5. Next question. Okay, bath or shower, 701.
This is about the describing of the zone. And zone one is limited by the vertical plane at a radius from the shower head. The scribes of zone one. The vertical surface to distance from the center point of the outlet 1.2 meters. B. 47 is B. 701.32.3. Forty-eight circuit supplying floor and ceiling heating systems, which is seven five three. I just go to the section and I read the rest of the question. Require additional protection by means of. Well, I'm already thinking an RCD. Additional protection, isn't it? Um, circuit supplying floor and ceiling heating systems require additional protection. Is there additional protection here? Uh, 753, yeah, 753.415, additional protection, RCDs, to 415.1.1, so yes, it's B, 48 is B, 753.415.1. Question 49. Swimming pools, 702. Equipment installed in zone zero. So this isn't asking about the zonal pattern. This is asking about equipment in there. So equipment installed in zone zero must have a minimum degree of protection in accordance with. So it's the external influence of equipment installed. So let's find this. So it's not the classification of external influences. Zone zero, zone zero. We're looking here for selection direction of equipment. So 702.5. We'll then see 702.512.2 external influences zone zero IPX8. A. So 49 is A. 50. Which item of information does not need to be handed over to the user of a newly installed agricultural installation? So the clue word there is agricultural. This refers obviously to horticultural and agricultural, 705. Why well, information does not need to be handed over to the use of a newly installed agricultural installation. So we're looking at handover here. So we go through requirements and protection, external influences, thermal effects, accessibility. Conduit, trunking, isolation, switching. This is probably the right thing. Diagrams and documentation. 705.514.9. What does it not need to be handed over? So the following documentation shall be provided to the user. A plan indicating the location of all equipment. The routing of all concealed cables. A single line diagram. And a necropotential bonding diagram indicating locations of the bonding connections. All right, so it's B, because we don't need to give the resistance and measurements. We need to just give a drawing of where they are. So 50 is B, and that's from 705.514.9.3. Fifty-one. In a caravan park, so not a caravan. Caravan Park. 708. The maximum number of socket outlets which can be protected by an RCD is. So we're looking at socket outlets. Plugs and socket outlets, other equipment. Socket outlets, so we go 708.55, what we got here. Mass number of sockets which is by an RCD. Let's 
Being our CD is actually probably Petitions Electric Shock Additional Protection. Let's have a look. TN Systems. RCDs. Okay, yeah. 70H.415.1. Every socket outlet shall be individually protected by an RCD. Okay, so the number, mass number of socket outlets with an RCD, well, it's individually. So it's 1. 708.415.1. 51 is A. 52. Okay, what is the requirement for the connection of supplementary agropotential bonding in an area intended to house livestock? That's referring to agricultural and horticultural again. Um, it, livestock, housing of livestock, supplementary bonding. Probably four and five dot two in there, seven oh five dot four and five dot two maybe. Let's have a look. Yes, yeah, seven oh five dot four one five dot two dot one. In the case it's intended for livestock, this is the right track. Submarine bonding will connect all exposed conductive parts and exchange conductive parts that can be touched by the livestock. So B. Fifty two is B. Fifty-three. Maximum height above ground for an electric inlet point on a caravan. So this isn't a caravan park. This is a caravan. Go to caravans. Seven two one. Uh, this is the position of the socket outlets, the inlets. So we go to the sockets. Okay, 721.55 other equipment, 721.55.1 inlet. And you can see it at the top of the next page, 721.55.1.2, the inlet shall be not more than 1.8 meters above ground level. D, 53 is D. 54, medical location in group one. Okay, medical location is 710. If you're wondering how I know those, it's just kind of like a habit, but if you don't know that, you can always go to the beginning of part seven because they're all listed. You haven't got to know them. They're all listed. You can just keep going, going there. It's not a problem. Medical location is 710. And note the questions will always give you that area to go to. Right, what is included within group one? There's a table here actually that tells us what is in a group one, what is in a group two, and that's what we're looking for. Um, Annex A710, right at the back, just before 711 basically. There's a table that gives us a list of locations and then groups zero, one, and two, and classifications. Which of these is in group one? So which of these answers is in the group one column? So operating theatre, that's group two. Delivery room, that's group one. Operating recovery room, group two. Premature baby room, group two. Notice although I found the answer with B, I always double check the rest to make sure I'm confirming that. So yeah, 54 is B, and that's from Annex A710. Question 55. Which item of current using equipment may not be installed in zone one of a bathroom? So go back to bathrooms, 701. Equipment, selection direction of equipment, and then the zones. So, 701.5 is selection direction of equipment. In the zones, we're talking about current using equipment here. So 701.55 current using equipment in zone one in zone one only the following fixed equipment all right so the question is which is not 
So one of these is not here. It's a self equipment. Uh, yeah, equipment protected by self. Shaver supply unit. No, that's missing. Water heater. Yeah, water heating appliances. Shower pump. Shower pumps. So a shaver supply unit is not allowed to be installed in zone one. I did kind of cover that back in um, section 413. Okay, so 55 is B. 56, moving on to the appendices now. 25 minutes to go. Four questions left. The first one, what rating factor must be applied to a multi-core 70 degree C PVC thermoplastic installed cable installed in free air if the air temperature is 50 degrees C? That sounds like a mouthful, but let's break that down. Let's remember our rating factors. C, A, C, I, C, G, C, C. Okay, it's referring to air, free air, ambient temperature. All right. We know that Appendix 4 is where our cable current carrying capacities and our volt drops come from. So this is in Appendix 4. So let's go to Appendix 4. Okay. This is referring to an ambient temperature in free air. If you look at the beginning of Appendix 4, it gives you a list of tables and there's rating factor CA for ambient air temperature other than 30 degree. Table 4B1. That's what we want. So let's go to table 4B1. Table 4B1. Rating factors CA for ambient air temperature. Free air, ambient temperature. Okay, so what's the ambient temperature? Well, we're giving 50 degrees. Which column though? It says here, 70 degree PVC thermoplastic. So it's the second column across. So 70 degree thermoplastic, 50.71. A. 56 is A. 57. Where can details of ring and radial final circuit races be found? Um, appendix 15. If you don't know, um, you can just flick through each one of them. Alternatively, you can go to the beginning of the appendices where they are listed at the beginning of the appendices on page 339. Ring and radial final circuit arrangements. Um, so that should be a doddle. That's appendix 15. Question 58. With regards to energy efficiency, okay, so that's the new appendix, appendix 17. One thing the designer should not take into account without losing quality of service and the performance of the installation is. Okay, so let's get there. Let's get to appendix 17. Energy efficiency, not taking account with losing quality of service. Okay. 17.3. The designer should take into account the following without losing the quality of service. What should not be taken into account without losing quality So in other words, what's missing from this list? So the load energy profile, that's there. The availability of local generation, that's there. The division of installation, that's not there and the tariff structure is there so the answer is C we don't need to take the division of installation into account with regards to losing the quality of service so it's C 58 is C question 59 type D circuit breakers to BSEN 6.98 should be installed to protect circuits subjected to okay um you won't see the wording of this. This is more about an understanding on the protected device characteristics. But the place to identify this is the time curve characteristic for type D circuit breakers and comparing it to C's and B's. So we'll go to the time curves in appendix 3 for the type D, um, which is figure 3A6 in appendix 3. Okay. 
And what we need to kind of do is just study the B, the C, and the D curve on the previous pages as well. And we're looking at the D on figure 3A6, the C on figure 3A5, and the B on figure 3A4. You'll notice they all have the same starting point at the very tip top with 10,000 seconds. Um, so they all have the same like point there. But with regards to them wrapping, um, you know, disconnecting rapidly, for a D, you must have a much larger amount of current compared to the C and then the B. They disconnect a lot quicker. So the question is, why would a protected device allow or require so much, so much of a larger amount of initial current for disconnection, and why just a small time? Why, why is it? You know, I mean, it's there. If you look that that quick, that vertical curve for the D stops around one, two, three seconds, and then it quickly gets back to the normal devices. So for three seconds, what? What can happen that requires a lot of power in three seconds? That's what we need to kind of translate from that. And if you think about it, that is a heavy starting current. That's what that's for. So the answer is D, heavy starting currents. And that brings us to question 60, which is a fairly simple one. Which classification code should be recorded where further investigation, without delay, is required during a periodic inspection and test of an installation? We'll go to Appendix 6, because that's where this is coming from, and we can look at the model certificate, and that will give us the answer. When we get there. So I'm in Appendix 6, I'm going through to the model sample of the Electrical Installation Condition Report. And I'm going to go to the part with the codes on it. So it's the page of the Condition Report with the codes. Uh, we're basically looking here at pages 474, 475. It gives us all this. And it tells us either at the bottom of page 474 on the model, it says FI further investigation required without delay, or it tells us this in the text on the right. But the answer is D. Okay, so, I mean, bear in mind that I've known answers, but I've looked for them. And I've obviously kind of talked to you guys. You can see that we've got an ample amount of time left, really, to kind of go back to anything that we want to double tech. But you can easily, if you waste, and if you waste time and doddle in the middle, you can always chew away at that time. You can always chew away at it, and you don't want to do that. So when you come to your exam and you get to this point, you, you should have a box here that will say progress. That must say 100%. If that doesn't say 100%, if it says 96% or 94%, it means one of your questions has been left unanswered. What you need to do is look at the left of the screen where you'll see all these little boxes that mark off as you answer them. One of them will still be a lighter grey, suggesting you've not answered that question yet. So before you finish the exam at the end, do make sure you've verified you've done 100% progress uh, and just make sure you're happy with how you've done. All right. Not once have we actually um, had to look in the index at all. I've not looked in the index once since I got this book, to be honest. I don't even know if there is an index in it. Um, the only real questions that kind of stumped us wasn't so much knowing the answer, it was more finding the wording of the answer in the book because the thing is you know you know the regulations but sometimes finding the exact wording to verify it can take time or can be a challenge because they reword things um, do try in your exam to not be insistent on finding the answers like we've just done go with your gut yeah remember every time I approached a question I said first of all is this protection against thermal effects, protection against electric shock, protection against overcurrent, is it selection of protected devices, selection of wiring systems, earthing and bonding? I went to the chapters and then the sections, and then I found the answers. I just went that way. You know, if you do that, it's a piece of cake. All right, guys. Um, I'm going to develop some more material um, papers and things if you want. I can do more of this if you want, but. I, I tend not to get you to practice exams again and again and again because 
it's more important to practice your knowledge. If anything, what I'd like you to try and have a do, and I'll do some papers, is to have a go with using the regs book as little as possible. Go with your knowledge, not so much the regs. Yeah, because some of it is obvious stuff. You're saying the regulations should be fairly strong at this point. All right. Um, okay, I'll end this video now because we are nearly at two hours. Yeah, we're nearly at the exact you know exam time, and I appreciate that you know we're just dragging this on now. Yeah, we'll leave it. All right. Um, if you want me to do something similar to this or do this again or do a live version where you can ask me questions and I can look for them or whatever, let me know. We can we can sort something out. All right, but this is just here as a resource for you. All right, good luck. Bye.